Hey yo! Welcome to the Agostino Zingo Show, episode number 80, 80, with me, your host, Agostino. How the fuck you doing, man? Shit. Finally out of the 70s, man. Finally out of those damn fucking sevens. You know, I know Kanye likes his fucking saint of sevens, but for the most part, I fucking hate the 70s. So yeah, back in the 80s. Here we are again, rising like a phoenix. Um, as you can tell from the background, if you're watching this on YouTube, if you're listening on audio, what are you doing? Click on the link below and watch this on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe and all that bullshit. As you can tell from the background, uh, I'm currently recording this at night. It's the first probably night podcast I've done, I think, probably in the history of me podcasting. I usually try and do these things uh, in the morning, you know, when you first get up. Um, when I, not when I first get up, but when I, when I first get up, if you would like to know, I have a nice glass of water. Um, I then brush my teeth. I then do some stretches and then I head out to have a run or to go to the gym. And then when I come back, um, I'm fortunate enough to start a bit late at my uh, place of occupation or my place of employing, employment, employee, employment. I start a bit late, so I, it affords me the time to come back home, read a book, do a bit of a mix, you know, a little DJ, could you, could you mix or record a lovely podcast as I'm doing right now. Fuck, man. But today, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of give, I wanted to put out two this week, you know, just to kind of get back on the, on the saddle again. And since I've been, you know, being a bit clean this week, um, working out well, eating well, keeping my mind and body, you know, in good harmony, I thought, why not amp the fucking output and go from there? Um, a funny thing happened actually the other day. I was actually thinking, um, I need to write a list of things because I remember I said actually that maybe last episode i don't know what episode it was but i mentioned this list that really helped me out back in the day right so if you're listening i'm holding up a list that i did um back in 2011 i think this top bits got ripped off by 2011 kind of um uh get done list to-do list right and the reason why this really helped me because i think at the time it made me accountable and sometimes writing things down the act of writing it and saying i'm gonna do this um, it does a weird thing to me. I don't know if everyone knows, but it really works. For, for instance, um, I was always big on to do when I was younger anyway, um, when it came to homework and all that kind of shit because I was always so scatterbrained. So I'd always write down what I was meant to do, like the minimum required uh, for me to pass or to get a certain grade in school, right? So I'd do the minimum effective dosage. I'd write down, okay, make sure you study at least a minimum of one hour today. So I studied an hour, but obviously when you, once, you, once you start getting into it or there's something that you're not quite getting, you will just surpass the hour. But if I told myself maybe if I was going to study an hour, I might not get got it done. So, you know, kind of giving yourself those little barriers and kind of knowing what works best for you, but also pushing yourself a little bit, it really helps. And I'm going to, I think I'm going to do this again for the end of the month. I'm going to write a little list, probably three things, not an eight. I did this one in 2011. I've got like eight things on there. I've got complete insanity, drug weight, drug more, eat more healthy, sleep better, blah, 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 blah. But I think I'm going to keep this one a bit trim and probably do meditation. Uh, so meditate every day in the week, right? Um, which is only like 10 minutes, especially if I'm doing stuff like, um, especially if I'm using the app, which I mainly use, uh, an app called Oak, which you can find on the app store. So do that for 10 minutes. So meditation one, I'll probably do a workout thing for another one. And then the third will probably be something to do with the podcast. So maybe like um, a minimum of, you know, two podcasts a week that'll be on my list. And then also I have on the back of it, you know, I have the other two to add on to it. And I think I'll exit off instead of, you know, usually when to do to do this, you kind of do it every day. Right. But because of the podcast, I might do it end of the week. I might have like a thing of like, OK, did you achieve your target? Yes or no? And then we can kind of have something accountable for. Because the working out thing is kind of easy. I do that anyway. But I'm kind of trying, you know, keep it to like five to six days, depending on how my body feels. So five, six, five, six days of working out, one day rest. And then um, the podcasting thing, just keep it for two at the moment. Because I'm, I'm, sometimes I do long ones, sometimes I do short ones. But I'm averaging about an hour each. So it might be a bit of a stress to do anything more. But if I start with two, then I can easily up the ante from there. And then the meditation thing. I think it's super crucial now, especially now um, where I'm kind of um, in two minds and thinking about what the next step is going to be and kind of where I want to put my efforts. Um, the uh, you know having a clarity of mind to make those decisions is super important. Um, I was I'm kind of using this platform as a good way to kind of get all my shit out of my head, you know, um, that I always kind of ruminate on or I think about. But also having the time, especially in the beginning of the day, to just collect your thoughts, uh, watch your breathing. 
you know, um, through guided meditation really does help um, me not be so reactive sometimes or be a bit twitchy or or be impulsive, you know, or be reckless, for instance, right? So that's something I'm going to try and do. And I think, yeah, like I said before, a list is super important, I think, personally. I think the act of writing something down, you know, there's that... Um, whole thing about you know everyone saying um you know the adage they use about people writing books or someone there's always someone out there who says they're writing a book right and it's never finished but i think that mainly comes from not even starting writing a chapter but i think if you commit yourself to writing a paragraph a day a chapter a day a line a day you eventually get to the point where you'll have like a fully fleshed first draft you know what i mean but sometimes you know it seems so, it, it just seems you gotta break it down basically sometimes the, the task can sometimes overwhelm you so I like to break it down into some manageable bite-sized chunks. So I know I can do, like, for instance, I know I can spare myself 10 minutes to meditate in a day. I already work out five days a week anyway at minimum. So if I stretch it to six, that's manageable too. And then the podcast thing, I'm just upping it to two for one for one week. And then if I, no, for maybe for a couple of weeks, if I achieve that target, then maybe I might add another one. But just taking incremental steps. But the most important thing is the act of writing it down. And talking about incremental steps, right? I've got this thing where I think it's been it's been brought to my attention lately uh, by a few people that as good as great as my attitude is, you know, to always see the brighter side of life and to always like um, see my glass as half full as opposed to half empty, it can sometimes leave me vulnerable because I tend to not not complain, right? I tend to not raise up issues that I'm. Um, uh, that are bothering me or that I'm concerned about just because I don't I just because I hate the sound of a man complaining if I'm completely honest right that's kind of like the Neanderthal with me right I just think the idea of a, of a man complaining about something especially when it's in especially if it's in his control to change it just feels really defeating it feels like you've kind of surrendered yourself to the outside forces to dictate how you move and what you say and that's not something that i want to be and that's something that i want to represent that's not something i am at all to be honest it's always something that's kind of irked me the wrong way which is why i've never been a fan of gossip and all that sort of shit it's just it just rubs me up the wrong way i don't think men should do that sort of stuff in my opinion again or anyone with a masculine energy for instance right i just think you know you should be a bit of a duke uh a go-getter but sometimes if you've had that if you have that kind of view on things you can kind of sometimes get yourself caught in a pattern where you're constantly making excuses for other people you're constantly seeing the good in everything when sometimes it can be just be bad it can just be malicious right and then when it comes to a point of defending yourself you can sometimes go i wouldn't say overboard but you can sometimes argue you could sometimes argue your position about something that you shouldn't be arguing about so imagine you've had all those times you've had you've had four other occasions to raise something up here yeah? and then once you and then at the fifth occasion when you finally had enough you try and remember all the other five or four things but as a guy i'm not sure about you guys but i'm not good as other people i can't really remember shit that i've been annoyed about you know maybe more than two things i'm i'm i'm, I'm really clutching at straws so you're um and ahhing stuttering all over the place you don't know what to say and then you kind of end up spurring out some any some any coherent stuff to kind of back yourself up. But you always sound a bit shitty. And then I, it got me thinking about um, this book that I read a long time ago, well, a couple of years ago, called uh, Extreme Ownership by Joko Willink. Right? I recommend it to anyone. He's like a former Navy SEAL who's appeared on Joe Rogan podcast, appeared on Tim Ferriss podcast. And he's just got like a really inspiring story. And he kind of uh, put it all in this first book called Extreme Ownership. And by, you know, just by looking at the at the front, you can kind of guess what it means. But the whole adage behind it, is taking full accountability of any of every situation you're in, whether good or bad, right? And the idea and the kind of premise it lends itself on is like um, people have this mis Jocko says anyway, the author. He said people have this uh, this misconception about the army, and they think it's always top down. It's always just like you know you obey your commands and then your soldiers you obey the general or whatever sergeant's commands and then the kind of soldiers go out and they do battle. But um, Jocko was saying that usually it's not like that. It's usually um, it's usually more of a communication. It works the same as any other company because, you know, sometimes you might have an elite force with you who kind of, you know, might know a bit more than a sergeant or might have other insights. And it's not just a top down, do this, go and kill so-and-so or go and invade this person. It will be more so like of a, what's the best plan? What's the best way to do this so we can all win? So more of a dialogue, right? But he also says sometimes when you hit a roadblock or things are not going well, he always teaches his cadets or his soldiers, whoever they may be, to always use the adage of extreme ownership, right? Where you're taking responsibility for everything and anything that happens to you. So that when it comes to... So the idea behind it is that if like a platoon had was short on supplies or something of that, of that sort, yes, he could blame his general for not uh, being um, vigilant enough 
and not rationing them enough supplies to last the mission, whatever it may be. But sometimes it could be it's, it could be beneficial for the team leader, whoever of the platoon, to be like, you know what, it's extreme ownership time. I take responsibility for not bringing it up before, for not planning ahead. And plus, you, you know, you're on the ground, so you'll know a bit more than that. Blah blah blah. It's always about before you go raise your issue to the big boss upstairs try and look inwards and kind of take uh, stock of maybe the things that you've done that kind of led you in that position and then kind of correct course. But as I mentioned before, sometimes I do, I think I've, I've done a good job so far since reading this and even before um, of kind of having this adage of like extreme ownership, you know, understanding that I am where I am because of the actions I've done in the past and it's not by fluke that I am where I am and any time and whatever, if I want to get out of the situation, then I have to change some things in order to get to where I need to get to, right? It's the idea of like, you know, um, What's that? It's that Einstein quote, right? Um, doing the same thing again and again, expecting different results is like insanity, right? That's like the insanity defined. So, you know, you, I don't, I don't want to be insane. And, you know, if you want to change things, you've got to do things that you haven't done before. And then hopefully, you know, be software enough to realize where you're going wrong or where you're going right. Blah, 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 blah. But as per usual, it can be hard, right? As humans, it can be hard to like not feel like you should defend yourself, even though you might be in a wrong, right? Even though it might be you know, let's say like 80% your fault, right? Or 90% or even 95% your fault, right? You still feel like you need to say something, right? And sometimes you just feel like you say something just because you want to feel like, um, you want to feel like it's never always okay with you, right? You want to not be the guy that's like always okay with everything. You want to sometimes kick up a fuss, right? And I think I, I was speaking to some friends the other day about it, um, about, um, how they are in restaurants when a re when a restaurant gets your or uh well, anywhere you go and eat whatever it may be a restaurant or fast food chain gets your order wrong what kind of person are they are they the person to kind of go back and say hey you guys missed x y and z or are you the kind of person to kind of like you know shut up and just eat it it's not it's, if it's if it's just about right then it's okay but a few people mentioned that you know if you start having that kind of idea or that kind of way of thinking then there's no limit to what you're going to accept really because you've kind of it's it's quite hard to have that kind of mindset and then suddenly speak up really it doesn't really happen and then when it does happen you usually speak out out of turn your tone's a bit aggressive you you just come out wild because you're you're kind of um you're kind of stockpiling all this fucking uh, all this um agitation from tap from before you've bottled it up right and then it's kind of exploding now on this poor old person who's you know maybe had may has made an honest mistake but you just kind of unload it all on them because you've got no one else to kind of blame so I was thinking about that and I was thinking, you know what, maybe that's right. Um, maybe I do need to kind of, you know, um, realize that being the kind of, uh, no, I won't say yes, man, but being the kind of it's okay guy can get you in trouble, um, especially when you don't kind of mediate it well. So that's something I'm kind of going to ruminate over on the weekend. I'm probably going to reread a bit, a few chapters in this book again, just to kind of get myself back in that thinking. But I just thought I'll share it with you guys in case, you know, some of you are thinking, because it can be easy to kind of fall into that trap of just, you know, pointing the finger or like you know thinking that you're not to blame and sometimes but i think for the most part i think for the most part it's very rare that you'll be in a situation especially when it comes to something that you've been confronted with or an argument or a debate or something it's very rare that it's just something that's come out of left field it's usually something that you've contributed to some way shape some way shape or form right um it's the whole idea behind um i've kind of had the same i've kind of i kind of know that's my blind spot because i know i've only now recently started doing a thing where because i don't like to complain i'm always prone to try and fix things for other people right so whenever someone complains about something to me i'm always offering i'm always willing to offer solutions but i've gleaned over the years that sometimes it rubs people up the wrong way when you offer a solution when they just want to whine or complain about something right and it just doesn't come across well it comes across like um you're a bit of a know-it-all right that um nothing flusters you that you're perfect which i'm far from right so the kind of the best way to do things, the best way to do that kind of thing I've heard, right, through very educated people is that you're meant to kind of emote and you're meant to kind of um, share or give examples of when you've been in the same position to the person before you offer a solution. And even then, you're meant to, I think I heard Jordan Peterson mention it on Fear Vaughn podcast, what you're actually meant to do is that you're meant to listen to maybe five or six, seven, I mean, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten scenarios where that person thinks they've been uh, done wrong. And you're just meant to hear them out. You're meant to be inquisitive, ask questions. Oh, um, why do you feel that way? Uh, why do you think that would have happened? Like, oh my God. I mean, you're meant to kind of really dig deep and really emote with that person. And then at the end, if there's an opportunity to, then offer your solutions, right? But the idea is that, you know, maybe some not everything is fixable and not everything is like, okay. Sometimes it can be annoying and you just have to kind of like speak on that. So I think that's been a blind spot in my life in general. 
and I think it kind of does need to be addressed. I'm never going to, I don't think I'm going to turn into the, you know, complainy, whiny person. That's not going to happen. But it also needs to be a point where I'm able to bring up my grievances so that when there is opportunity, so, so that when I'm ever told off, when, I, when, I, when I'm ever criticized about something, I don't use that as a chance to then kind of like say, oh, but actually, you, so-and-so did that, you know, like that, because that sounds really immature. And that sounds like you're not, really listening to what's being said at that moment in time right you're just waiting for your chance to say but you know you're like waiting for like no no, no actually i was not in the wrong sort of thing which never really works out well so that's what i'm going to do over the weekend i'm going to meditate over a bit of extreme ownership and you guys can pick this up too on amazon i think it's available um, i really highly recommend it um extreme ownership i'll read a little there's a someone let's say a joke what did there's a, these little quotes in the back or does it give you a little brief yeah let me see so basically extreme ownership the little thing on inside says by Jocko Winnick, I'll read it. It says, uh, sent to the most violent and dangerous battlefield in Iraq, Jocko Winnick and Leif Babin, uh, SIL task unit, face a seemingly impossible mission. Help US forces secure Ramadi, a city deemed all but lost. In gripping first-hand accounts of heroism, tragic loss and hard-won victories in SIL team, freeze task unit bruiser they learn that leadership at every level is the most important factor in whether a team succeeds or fails winnick and babin returned home from deployment and instituted still leadership training that helped forge the next generation of still leaders after departing the still teams they launched um echelon front a company that teaches these same leadership principles to businesses and organizations from promising startups to fortune 500 companies babin and winnick have helped scores of clients across a broad range of industries build their own high performance teams dominate their battlefield uh now detailing the mindset and principles that enable still units to accomplish the most difficult combat missions the stream ownership shows how to apply them to any team or organization each chapter focuses on specific topics such as covering and move the disenfranchised command leading up to the chain explaining what they are why they are important and how to implement them in a leadership environment so i highly recommend it for anyone read listening or watching over the youtube i'm gonna meditate this weekend see where i go Anyway, back to the old podcast stuff and topics and all that malarkey because that's the most fun part of this sort of thing. And, you know, because it's the, you know, it's, it's break time, why not little, a little bit of a mm, spark up to get the day rolling or to get the night rolling, actually. So, see what some topics I've got lined up today that I wanted to discuss with you lovely people. Number one. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have seen the article. It's been floating around on the internet. I've seen it featured some places on the little interwebs. But it's about uh, our man, James Blake, right? So uh, James Blake gave an interview recently with Billboard where he said he's basically depressed and has suicidal thoughts. And um, I guess it might make a little bit of sense because he's been quite quiet, right? I think he had a tour towards the end of last year. And then he released a couple of singles or a couple of Lucy's. But we haven't heard that much of him. Um, I think he's worked on other, other than a few people's albums, like in the background, but we haven't heard a lot of like um, material. F we haven't heard a lot of music from James Blake. Um, any update on the new album? So it's been a bit quiet, and he kind of, you know, and there's been a big. It feels like there's been a big conversation with uh, about mental health, especially in the entertainment industry, right? Um, ever since maybe even before the Avicii stuff happened, everyone's kind of talking about you know what mental health is, what that means, the pressures of being a big star. But um, I'm also a little bit sceptical about everything that's been said about mental illness in general because I'm not sure how we're diagnosing mental illness and I don't, sh and I'm, sorry, mental health. And I'm not sure if the examples such as James Blake, who's one of the, I don't know, one of the most influential artists of his genre. He's very in, much in demand behind the scenes, even in front of the camera, behind the scenes and also with the general public. He tours a lot. Um, he's operating on the highest level of like entertainment, right? So for someone like Kim to say he's having suicidal thoughts or he's had, you know, doubts about his career and all that sort of thing, it kind of makes sense, right? And would you, would you kind of say that was comparable to someone that's working a nine-to-five and actually suffering from real mental, or not say, let's say, quote-unquote, real mental uh, health issues? And if it's not, then what do we, is, is that not just like a byproduct of being successful? And I'll throw that question out there because I think maybe the next chapter of this conversation, because I think mental health has finally entered back into the zeitgeist and everyone's talking about it in the public square. No one's kind of ashamed to say when they're feeling a little bit down or they have suicidal thoughts, right? It won't, once that's, now that's in the public conversation, I think the next step is to kind of highlight the fact that the people that we look up to or the people some people deem as idols or whoever they be, it might be celebrities and stuff, uh, cultural figures. We have to show the other side of 
that, what it means, what, what, how, what the toll it takes on you professionally, right? Uh, what you have to give up personally um, to kind of achieve your dream to be the kind of, you know, the 0.0.1% of person out there who's kind of really influencing culture. Because if you look at it really, you know, look at the Billboard Top 100 and look at the people that are on that list, you know, it's the same people that are on that list again and again and again. Uh, um, touch wood, they don't get into an accident or they don't fall off and they don't, you know, end up losing themselves. They're going to be there, you know, until the end of time, basically, or until, you know, until we pass and the next kind of round of people come up. So to even get to a James Blake level, you just have to be the best of your class, right? And that can weigh on you and you can kind of have to have those thoughts. So I kind of wanted to read a bit of what he said and maybe expand on it a little bit. Um, so um, I've got it up on the screen now, hopefully. Yep. So James Blake says the following on Billboard. Um, a month after taking to Twitter to criticize the media's description. I'm reading some Billboard. I'm going to link it in the description anyway. Um, a month after taking to Twitter to criticize the media's description of his work as Cyboy Music, Mercury Prize winning songwriter, James Blake spoke at the annual symposium of Performing Arts Medicine Association, PAMA, on Sunday at Chapman University in Orange County, California, to discuss his own experiences with depression, anxiety, and to encourage artists struggling with similar issues not to suffer in silence. Speaking on the panel, speaking as part of a panel called You Got This, Blake uh, spoke openly about his depression leading to suicidal thoughts while on tour early in his career. I was taken, which is the interesting part, this is early in his career, it's not even now, so, I was taken away from normal life, essentially my age, at my, at an, an age where I was half formed, said the South London um, musician, um, and he carries on and says, your connection to other people becomes surface level, so if you're, if so, if you were only in town for one day and someone asks you who, how you are, you go into the good stuff, which generally doesn't involve how anxious you feel or how depressed you feel. Black, Blake had added that unhealthy eating habits and common peril of touring musicians exacerbate these mental struggles. I would say that the chemical imbalance due to diet and uh, deterioration of my health was a huge, huge factor in my depression and ex uh, extens eventual suicidal force. I developed a dietary intolerance that would lead to existential, existential depression on a daily basis. I would eat a certain thing and then all day I would feel like there was just no point. Whoa, that's fucking heavy. It's heavy and it maybe lends a little bit of credence to what I said before, right? So we're hearing someone like James Blake saying in the beginning of his career, not even now, right? Um, with retrograde, his collaboration with James, with um, Frank Ocean and many, many, gra many, many Grammy nominations, all that malarkey, right? We're not saying that James Blake. We're saying James Blake that started in the beginning, right? The Willem Scream James Blake, right? He's saying he was under that much pressure, which makes sense because I've always thought, I think it might be a little bit better, which sounds crazy, right? But it might actually be a best, better thing if you're an entertainment or if you're an entertainment star to kind of make it like Justin Bieber, right? To make it when you're really young because you only know one reality, right? You're only used to having people scream after you, take paparazzi shots and, you know, kind of suck up to you. And then, uh, and then maybe then you can kind of, you know, recalibrate, right? And enter back into normal society, which kind of, you know, you feel like Justin, Justin Bieber's doing at the moment, right? He's got that whole hippie haircut thing. He's wearing, like, hippie kind of clothes. He's, you know, he's not really hiding his relationships. And he's out and about and shit. Goes to festivals, just a jam. You kind of feel like he's in that kind of zone, right? It might be better to be that person than to kind of make it relatively not at a normal age. Like, let's say, between the age of, like, 19 and 32, right? Making it then because you've got an actual database of experiences of being like a normal person so to suddenly go from you know getting the central line to go to oxford street circus to go work and then suddenly to being having people running around after you um wanting to get your signature and shit licking your ass uh being at your beck and call whenever you need them it must be a really weird mind fuck it must be super super weird to kind of get used to like what the fuck's going on do you know what i mean even though your artistry or whatever you do um, whether you're just a socialite or you're a musician, even though the artist should kind of justify the fact that, you know, no, I'm, I am an influential person. That's why people are talking to me. Even though that should kind of give you some sort of, um, uh, it should make you feel good or it should give you some sort of safety. It probably doesn't. And it isn't probably healthy in the long run, which, which is why a lot of the biggest guys, especially the people like, you know, you hear um, Beyonce and Jay-Z say, right? They don't even want to be that famous, right? They just, they'd rather just be influential culturally than being like famous in the, in the face of everyone, right? Like interviews everywhere, magazine spreads, all that sort of malarkey, right? Because you want a bit of an anonymity. But like I said before, and like I think he mentioned a bit further up in the, in the text, which is interesting. I think uh, someone like Joe Rogan mentioned it a few times. It's always a spiral, right? It comes, it doesn't come in by itself. So, you're really successful young. Um, you end up touring. You get taken away from your family and friends. And you end up living this kind of fake existence surrounded by people that, you know, just want to be close to you so that they can keep their job. 
And then, you know, you end up getting in worse bad habits, eating wide, you know, exercising and shit. And I've known from my own personal pit, my own personal journey, when I was the lowest or when I was feeling the most shittiest, it usually everything else in my life was falling apart too. Whether it was work, relationships, eating, uh, weight, fitness, whatever it may be, right? Um, the way I dress sometimes, right? You would see it. It's, it was like super, super blatant. And sometimes the one, changing one thing, like doing your bed in the morning, uh, making sure all the plates in the sink are clean, uh, cleaning your room, rearranging your books, uh, rearranging your wardrobe, uh, going for a walk, going for a jog, working out a bit, changing eating habits. Those tiny little micro um, steps, right, can sometimes make in really, really big changes in other places because your mind starts thinking. It's like when I first when I first ran, when I ran my first 5K, immediately I was like, if I could do that, I could double this and do a 10K, right? It starts to automatically think, oh, that's not as hard as I thought it would be. Like you, it's a that's maybe why the list thing maybe works so well, right? It's like, oh, if I write it down, it's not it's not that big of a deal to say like, okay, drop this certain amount of weight. It's just a number, you know. At the moment, I'm that number. If I just write that down, that I'm gonna try and get to that number. And then once you do get that number, seeing that you seeing that you writ something and seeing that you know you remember when you writ it, seeing that satisfaction of knowing, wow, I did that, you know, I did that thing. It's sort of like this. It's sort of maybe the same satisfaction people get when they make a shopping list, right? When they go to get food shopping for the week, right? You kind of, it's that satisfaction of like, mm, everything's got crossed off, right? And you, how bummed do you feel when you forgot something on the list? Or if you get it, you forgot it in a, in a basket or something. You feel super annoyed, right? It's that satisfaction of like crossing something off. So those micro things were super important. So I'm glad James Blake kind of said it. Like, you know, it's not just a career, it's not just being famous was the trouble. It was these eating habits that also didn't help. But I think that's a big part of the industry nowadays, especially with all the young kids coming up that I'd hope they kind of would uh, put more of a attention to. Or I guess maybe behind the scenes, there hopefully are more companies doing it because I'm sure there's loads of companies now behind the scenes with these, whole, with these SoundCloud rappers or all that other stuff coming up now. Or even the drill people in the UK. I'm sure there's people who are managing them and doing all their social media, styling them clothes wise. But I think it's really important for people at that age, especially the SoundCloud rappers and the drill guys from the UK who kind of make it, you know, at a normal age. Not, there's no one really making it at 12, 13 for the most part. They're all making it kind of like, you know, between the age of 19 and 32. I think it's really important to kind of have someone there in a team or get that person to maybe see someone to kind of, you know, for grounding, you know, a grounding of like, okay, you went from being like, you know, working at Popeyes or working at Foot Locker, rapping on the side, uploading videos, maybe maybe being known to your friends and family. Maybe you're well known in your area as one of the best rappers on your street, blah, blah. But to go from that to suddenly having millions of views on YouTube, it must be a complete mindfuck, especially when you've got those millions of views on YouTube are real actual, are actual real fans. So when you put on the show, when you do a meet and greet, when you play at a festival, you'll see these people, you know, and it'll, and plus if you come on, if you've like an independent and you come from the drill scene or SoundCloud, you'll have people in the industry, label executives, uh, even celebrities maybe that you've looked up to all your life, retweeting, reposting your music. It must fucking really bug, it must fuck you up in the head. You might develop an ego, think you're, you know, your shit don't stink. And then the other side of the coin is, you know, that self-doubt, right? That imposter syndrome. Feeling like, how the fuck did I do it? I sh I'm not. I'm not even. You know, I'm not even the best. I'm not even the best rapper in my area. I'm not the best singer. How did I manage to do this? Right? You feel like you shouldn't really be there. You're in a party surrounded by people like Mariah Carey and Jamie Foxx. You're like, I'm not as talented as them, not right? And that kind of self-talk, it really, it, it does help to have someone to speak to, and it also does help to have people around you who can kind of ground you anyway. So when you are going to these kind of events, it doesn't really phase you. But I would love to. I would love if there was more of an attention on that, like in media overall. Um, it seems as if like everyone, all these big artists are saying they're meant, they have mental health issues, are quite well known, are, are operating on the highest platform. But a lot of the reporting that's been said about it is sort of like, you know, hey, James Blake has mental health issues. So if you have them, it's okay, you're normal. We know the mental health is normal. We've talked about it enough, right? But James Blake's mental health is not the same as someone working at MNS full time. It's not the same, I'm sorry. It's a different type of it's a different type of mental health issues, but it's also the mental kind of mental health issue that needs explaining because the guy or girl working at MS probably thinks if I become James Blake, I'll be okay, right? So that's what needs to be taught, told. It's like, no, even if you do become James Blake, there's, there's another kind of pressure that you're going to feel being at that kind of level. And that's, that's something that needs to be spoken about a lot more, especially since, you know, we're living in the age of SoundCloud. People have so many, people have such easy means to, to get involved, to kind of, you know, cross, kind of like, you know, um, go behind the red rope and become that star too. You can also get on the stage. You can also be, you know, you can be 
one of the biggest people in your area without me even know or without anyone know who you are right you can have millions millions of views and be a very you know regional based artist through social media and through just you know just the ease of use of having a laptop and making beats at home so that idea that the barrier of entry has been lowered but there is needs to be a more of an sense of like okay not everyone's built for this life not everyone can be um beyonce and jay-z right not everyone can be leonardo dicaprio right who's able to be one of the well-known people in the world but kind of keeps himself to himself kind of thing not everyone can not everyone's built for that life so maybe some more education done in that regard but i thought it was interesting article regardless i'll link it in the show notes you guys can check it out really good interview with james blake and i'm happy that he's kind of maybe in a better place now which explains why we haven't heard any music from him in general anyway um next on the next on the docket oh permit patty you guys have hopefully seen this video it's all over youtube everyone's been speaking about it but i thought it'd be interesting to kind of expound on it a little bit better a little bit more uh give my kind of my take on it but interesting story from the america i think it's in uh new york right so basically the story goes is this lady living in this block and there's a kid selling water outside her building right she gets annoyed and she kind of calls the police and it kind of, you know, it just shows, you know, I don't know. We're living in a world, we're in a world world at the moment. But let me just play the video and you guys can maybe hear it. Play, come on. I'll play it. San Francisco 911, what's the exact location? Oh, yes. I'm on the sidewalk. Hi, I'm having someone that um, does not have a vendor permit that's selling water across from the ballpark. Uh, the woman known as Permit Patty reportedly said she didn't actually call the police on a child who was selling water on a San Francisco sidewalk. But phone recordings obtained by a local news station prove otherwise. Okay, one second. Let me trust you over to the police department. Hang on. Great. Thank you. Her name is Allison Edel, and she resigned from her job after getting backlash when this video spread of her claiming to call police on an eight-year-old girl who was trying to raise money for a trip to Disneyland. She called police on an eight-year-old little girl. You can hide all you... <coughs> <coughs> oh, God. So the story <laughs> is so bad you can hear. is ridiculous, right? So this is a grown woman who's kind of, you know annoyed that someone is selling water in front of her house and maybe the noise is getting on her nerves so she calls the police right on an eight-year-old girl selling water to raise money for charity whoever, whatever even if she's selling water to raise money for herself so she can buy toys and and loads of candy it doesn't matter right but this woman feels the need to go call the police now it's a weird thing because i think i don't know sure what is happening in the states but there seems to be uh, a real fear uh, of black people or cut or people of color for POCs, right? In in America, it seems like. But again, maybe it's anecdotal, so I don't want to read too much into it because maybe we're only seeing, you know, we see these videos and because they go viral, it makes us think that everything ev it's always like that, and it might not be like that, right? It might just be like a, a an actual honest um, query or honest worry that lady had. But I can't get past the idea that it's we it's very interesting to me how one community, right? People of color or disenfranchised people in whatever neighborhood, even if they're white or black, right? They have a different relationship with police, right? And if you're a law-abiding citizen, your relationship with the police is completely different, right? You feel oh, you feel it's, you feel it's like your moral duty to tittle tattle, right, and to, or to tell on someone if they're doing something wrong. You're not you're not bothered about calling the police if you feel someone's done something out of line. And the police are sort of like your um, quote unquote. It's like calling your big brother to come fight your fights, right? You're instantly going to them, running to them straight away because you can't do anything. And it's just interesting how how um in this story the lady is so quick to call the police i think that's the thing that kind of it worries me about race relations race race relations in the u.s it seems if they've gone they've, they've gone you know they've taken a big steps you know things have kind of improved but under the surface there's weird things happening like for instance the other guys in starbucks in philly right so the story goes with those guys in starbucks in philly that um one guy was waiting in starbucks for his friend to come um, the manager asks um, if he's going to buy a drink. He can't stay if unless he's going to buy a drink. He says, no, I'm waiting for a friend. And then straight away, the manager goes and calls the police, right? And by the time the friend come, the police come, and then a kind of, in, uh, a kind of dis you know, a discussion erupts. The police end up arresting the guys and taking them out of the coffee shop. And whenever I saw the video, everyone was like outraged. Plus, we learned that that area of Philadelphia is predominantly black, right? It's like 70 percent black. They've got a black mayor. Like, it's crazy shit, right? So it's even worse that that's happening in that kind of area. It wasn't like happening in a redneck area, for instance, quote unquote, right? A kind of like stereotypical racist area. But it's like the issue is that is you not know, there's these people who are t who are even if even if the manicures again, I think each store should have the should be allowed the discretion to kind of you know manage the store as they please, right? 
if you work in a very busy Starbucks and a busy street and it's always full and there's patrons inside your cafe not eating or not drinking anything, then asking them to move or asking them to buy something in order to stay is a good thing, right? If you're in a really empty one, maybe you might be a bit more lax, a bit more carefree about how people treat the place. I think every manager should have their should have a carte blanche within the boundaries of like, you know, the code of ethics of each company to kind of manage the store as they please. So it's okay if like maybe that manager is known to be a bit of a hardline boss, but to go from asking someone if they're going to order a drink and then and then them saying no and calling the police without saying, hey, if you don't order a drink, I'm going to call the police. That's the bit that kind of worries me a bit sometimes. It's too quick. And you kind of think, if that was a white person, would they be so quick to call the police? I don't think so. You know, even if someone said no. And the same with this issue with this lady in, in San Francisco. It wasn't even New York, actually. My mistake. With a little young girl. It's kind of like, you know, like, you've, of course, I think... Because I think she explained it in another video. Um, actually, that I'll play. I actually played the other video too. She's explaining it, which is always, which I think is always a bad idea in general. I think I always gonna, I'm always gonna lean more to the Drake side of things, right? Drake's I think said in one interview. I think it might be with Zayn Low, that he always, whenever any controversy comes up, I think Zayn Low asks him about how he kind of is always able to kind of you know matrix and dodge everything that's coming at him in terms of rumors and shit. And he says something along the lines of like, he gives every rumor, every story 48 hours or something or 72 hours. I think 72 hours. He says, uh, if, it's, if, people are, if people are still talking about after 72 hours, he might consider um, responding or saying something. But he says, usually in his experience, most stories kind of go away after 72 hours because, you know, there's something else that will kind of replace it in a new cycle. So with that being said, it kind of, you know, it's the Jane Jordan Peterson thing of like, um, you should never kind of over explain yourself, right? You shouldn't need to defend yourself or something that you don't need to defend yourself. So, and plus with this thing being so weird, you know, a big lady coming out, calling the police over an eight-year-old kid, even if she's screaming at the top of voice, calling the police and not being adult enough to kind of deal with the situation parent to parent because the mum was there, that was the person I was recording. It just, you're never going to come across well. But she kind of did give an interview and kind of explain her side of the story. I'll quickly play this and then I'll give you my thoughts on that. A little girl was trying to sell bottled water so she could go to Disneyland. Now her story has exploded into a flood of controversy. That video of her neighbor calling the police now viewed more than a million times. Cold water, two dollars only. This morning, eight-year-old Jordan Rogers is an internet sensation for selling bottled water on the street in front of her house. This woman don't want to let a little girl sell some water. This woman is Allison Edel. This morning, she's a social media villain for calling the cops on her young neighbor. Yeah, and um, illegally selling water without a permit? We don't know what happened leading up to this video being shot. Edel, being called Carpet <coughs> Patty online, says she was working at home upstairs. And Jordan's sales pitch is loud and nonstop. I have tried to be polite, but I was stern. And and I said, please, I'm, I'm trying to work. You're screaming, you're yelling. And people have open windows. It's a hot day. Can you please keep it down? Edel says she never confronted Jordan. Just her mother, Erin Austin, who took this video. She calling police on an eight-year-old little girl. You can hide all you want. The whole world gonna see you, boo. Austin tells a different story. She never asked us to be quiet. She just came out and directly demanded to see a permit to sell water from an eight-year-old. Saturday night. So, of course, you know, you can't believe everything um, the mother is saying. You can't also believe everything uh, Permit Patty is saying. But, you know, the truth... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> The truth is somewhere in the middle. So let's imagine she does come out and confront the mother and they kind of have a discussion. She goes straight to the police. I do kind of have a feeling that, you know, there is something empty within Permit Patty. I wonder what's happening to her in her life that... Because you have to think, right? I mentioned before at the top of the show, you know, I'm trying to not be um, always everything's hunky-dory kind of guy. But there's also the idea of, like, you know, the person who's willing and able to kind of kick up that much of a fuss over something like this, something so trivial, something so seemingly trivial... You kind of have to think, you know, what's wrong? What's happened in your life? I, mean, I, I'm, I think I remember hearing Ari Shafir say something along the lines of, the comedian Ari Shafir say something along the lines of, um, when someone's really rude to him or is really cunty about something really small, he's always like, okay, cool. I was wrong, no worries, but what happened to you, right? To kind of like, you know, it's obviously like a bit of a backhanded diss sort of thing, but it's also the idea of like, you know, 
if you're that jumped up and that pissed off that I've opened the window, there's something else going on in your life that you're annoyed about. It's like, you know, when you're at rush hour traffic and rush hour uh, traffic and, or, you know, on the way to work and everyone's bumping you and pushing you and shit, usually it's not to do with you, it's to do with whatever they're going through, whether they hate their job, they have an argument with their wife or husband and shit. So you have to imagine that someone that's doing something like that has to be feeling really fucked up inside. I don't know what it is, what's happened in her life, what's kind of led to the position, position, but... You'd hope in this world that we live in now, there'll be a bit more civility, you know? You'd kind of want, have a discussion, adult to adult, you know, with the mother and say, even she's making a lot of noise, right? Imagine if, like, the mother's got, mother's got, like, a fucking vuvuzela, right? Do you remember those things from South Africa? Vroom, vroom, vroom. South Africa woke up, right? That's annoying things, right? Or, like, a horn or some shit, right? That will be annoying. Or she's got one of those um, megaphones, right? And she's shouting through there, like, water, two dollars each bottle, whatever, whatever, right, yeah? That could be annoying, but you'd hope that someone would come up to you and, and complain directly and say, hey, keep it down, right? It's like, uh, I remember one time I was DJing in my house, recording a mix and it was really loud and someone banged the door or banged the door and said, hey, um, I, I don't mind you playing your stuff, but can you keep it a bit low and it's a bit crazy now. That's cool, right? And I lowered it and I've been fine ever since and they've never complained uh, again. But to go from me DJing and then straight away calling the police and saying this and raising a noise complaint, that's fucked up, you know what I mean? And that's, that, that's, that's, that's a bitch move. And I don't think a bitch move is limited to only guys. It is a, a woman, everything overall. I think as an adult, you know, you should be able to kind of like, you know, raise your concerns adult to adult. I think if it was different if the girl was on her own and it was like a little kid who was really, you know, a little snotty kid who was being a dickhead and answering back and stuff, cool. I get it. Playing patty, call the police. I don't want to deal with this woman or this little child or whatever. Cool, but with the mum there, it's like... I don't know, man. But then, you know, she said, again, she said sorry, right? She apologized in the video that's, that says here, right? She apologized for everything. And the only thing that I'm a bit annoyed about, it seems like the, because um, what's happened, I think, in the aftermath is that they find out she's some sort of, what's she run? Like an edible, was it, is it, you know, it's edible weed, so some sort of uh, pharmaceutical weed thing, right? She's got her own business, right? And somehow, um, whatever places stocked her products are now not stocking her products anymore because of the outrage and all that malarkey. And it seems like, you know, the internet as, you know, for all those benefits wants to just drag her instead of like rehabilitating this lady, right? Instead of like um, re-educating her and, and like telling her how to kind of cooperate or how to go about things. I've seen some people say online, you know, uh, what you call it? Um, the police is not customer service, right? Yeah, that, that idea of like 911 isn't just for, to, you know, to kind of complain that your neighbor's being a dickhead. It's like real emergencies. So that kind of needs to be done. But I think it's a teachable moment. Instead, it's turned into like a shame moment. A constant, I know she's she's being harassed all over the place. Uh, people are living a death threats, all that malarkey. I just think it's completely unacceptable. Even if she was being a complete bigot, I think there's, there is opportunity unless, they sh unless the person shows that there is no point of return. They're not going to change. I think there is opportunity to kind of rehabilitate people and kind of say, hey, I know you fucked up with this thing and I know something that you might not think was a big issue, but here's why it was a big issue and here's how we can make it better. That's a lot. That's that's more beneficial to all parties than doing this, dragging someone in public like this. It just doesn't do anything. Um, she's, back in the, she's back in her corner trying to defend her point, not trying to make herself look stupid. People on the internet just want to continue digging up stuff from her past and post it online. I just think... I just get a little bit sad when I see stuff like this, you know? Like, there is... It, it doesn't seem that there's any civility, any grown-ups, like, anyone just, like, kind of take the high road and say, okay, even though you fucked up, right, let me just... Let's have a conversation, say that I don't like what you did, and just move on. Everyone needs to kind of get ended, you know? People's products get dropped, people get lose TV shows, they lose this... Just because of a one a, a mistake they made. Not like an innocent... Not an innocent mistake. A mistake done, you know, they've done it intentionally, but it's a mistake nonetheless, right? Unless you, unless someone tells you you fucked up, you don't, you won't know until you fucked up. The internet is very quick to to call people up on their shit, but they're not very good at rehabilitating and telling people what they should do next. It's always just like you know a shame sort of thing, and that's the kind of thing that kind of bummed me out overall reading the permit patty story. And I just, I don't know, I just kind of hope it kind of all kind of, um, it kind of all gets sorted out, and she's allowed to kind of return back to her normal life, you know? Because I don't know, I felt sad about it. Anyway, um. Long story short, next topic I want to talk about is high sobriety, right? An article that I saw on Sense that, that kind of maybe links to what I'm doing at the moment, even though, you know, there's a bit of a, an irony here with the whiskey in hand. But there's this article that I read on Sense magazine. Sense is a, I think, Canadian-based um, online retailer. You know, they specialize in, you know, loads of streetwear and high fashion luxury sort of stuff that everyone wears, such as Rick Owens, Palace, um, Acne, all that sort of shit, right? And they have loads of really good articles. They've done a really good job of like um, 
I think I've, I've heard some people do the same sort of thing, right? They kind of everyone's kind of doing the same sort of thing with their online because it's you, it's hard now now in this time of day, right, to just be an online retailer and just sell clothes, right? You need to kind of produce your own content. You need to have an editorial side. You need to have a you need to have your social media on deck. Like you kind of really need to produce your own content consistently to bring people to the store, and it's a good cheat way, right? If you've got really cool interviews or really good features and really good videos and stuff on your um, online store, it's a good cheat way to kind of get people in the funnel and to kind of say, hey, on the side, you know, here's some stuff you might like or like like this series. Why not buy the outfit? So and so what? So, but anyway, everyone's kind of do the same sort of thing. But um, Sense really do do some really good cool articles because nothing is the thing I like about Sense is that or Essence, I think they're called. But it's spelled with a double S, um, just sense, which you see on online, so www.wsense.com. Uh, the, I think the good thing that they do is that they interview people that they interview people that don't even have anything to do with the website. So, for instance, they interviewed recently um, a guy from GQ Style, um, Will Leach. I think you pronounce his name is. He's got a podcast too called Corporate Lunch. Uh, you should check out. Um, that he does with his colleague Noah Johnson. Um, they had interviewed him recently, and he, you know, he doesn't sell nothing on there. He hasn't got any merch, but it's just like a way to kind of, you know, bring other people's audiences to your platform. And I like that idea of like, you know, it doesn't always have to be someone that uses your site to kind of get an interview. As long as they um, are someone that, as long as it's someone that has some sort of link to what you do, I think it works out. Anyway, they had this, they had this really cool article called High Sobriety that I thought was interesting that I kind of wanted to read a little bit about and kind of, ex you know, maybe expand a little bit on things that I thought were interesting. So the article is uh, on, S S again, a Sense or Essence, as you call it. I'll link it again in the show notes if you listen to this on audio. Um, an article written by Arshi Aziz. Um, so it starts off. It, I think it's very important to drink lots of water. Victoria Beckham wants op uh, opinion. Or pinned or pinned, which Paris Hilton second seconded immediately, remarking that massages are important too. Historically, the need to fluent self care prioritization has gone hand in hand with this cult of celebrity in its extreme, devol uh, devolving into a sort of unsettling exhibitionism, like when Katy Perry or Cher blatantly parade face masks in public. But lately, self care has detached itself from celebrity culture and morphed into an entire self sufficient industry, which is very interesting, which is very true. You can even see it with makeup industry, but in terms of self care, you definitely see a lot of it. Um, online on social a lot of people are taking a lot of people are using a lot of people have switched to the idea of like you know wealth is not just the idea of like being a rich kids of instagram with like a hublot um the other way to kind of show wealth now is by you know how many retreats are you going on what sort of um self-care products are you using blah 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 especially like high ticket items um today various sectors of self-care uh could easily could join in large ikea like department store whose aisles might be devoted to everyday necessities like uh, simple mindfulness or luxuries like a uh, vinyasa flow cognitive behavioral therapy and even diaphragmatic breathing but the sin qua non of non of healthy living which permeates um all these factors is undoubtedly the turn towards cheek sobriety reflecting a new consumerism demand to look good feel good too and a grassroots claim to overturn long-held perceptions of age-old trade-off which i thought was interesting because i think nowadays especially in the scene overall i think it's more common to hear someone say they're completely sober right and it usually isn't from a point of um, excess it's not like someone was drinking from a long time for you know they had a problem and had to kind of address it it's usually just from a purely lifestyle sort of thing of like nah I, i'm not really big on the drink kind of thing and i've seen it a lot lately especially with the younger generation and um of course maybe it's linked to the self-care thing and it, or it kind of helps the self-care thing as well because you have a lot of people you know i hear people saying on comments you've watched videos of like playboy Carter or asap block have an interview they'll be saying you know in the comments of the video oh i wonder what cream he uses to get his skin so soft right instead of ask instead of like being inspired that he uh smokes a million joints or whatever or does drugs or does lsd people are like you know commenting on maybe what skin products you use which is a very interesting turn but i think it's a turn for the better especially when you're seeing i've seen a lot of retreats for djs i've seen a lot of them kind of like go into bali i think bali was always a bit of a hot spot but now it's turning into a retreat for big djs who are kind of using the opportunity to kind of reset especially when there's a bit of a gap in tour life right to kind of get yourself balanced again and as well if you're a big dj right if you're someone that's really performing at a high level or in general wherever you may be even fashion week stuff you're you know um one of the an important influencer you're flying all around and going to runway you go into fashion weeks all over the world couture shows all over the world you go into new york new york book fair you go into freeze all that sort of shit 
you kind of have to be on your best um, going in order to kind of keep those clients or to kind of be a, a good ambassador for whatever brand that you're representing. So to kind of be the person who's going to go to a, he's going to get booked into the Lion Hotel in Los Angeles or a nice, uh, uh, you know, or Shoreditch House room somewhere in whatever city it may be. Um, to get booked in those kind of places and just use the opportunity to kind of, you know, pamper yourself, go in the steam room, have a massage, have a drink, go and do your duty. It's, it probably is quite a chic and good way to stave off old age and you know there's probably going to be more people especially in the younger generation coming especially with the advances in medicine or even the advances in like plastic surgery there will be definitely or even like um uh dna replacement uh stuff uh or stuff like crispr and stuff there's going to be people that will look if not if not the whole idea behind you know being immortal right or whatever it may be like living onto a thousand the idea that maybe you know you could you know take your conscious somewhere else into another body but there will be a lot of people who will reverse the signs of aging you know the idea of like when you meet someone that looks really good for their age so maybe the younger generation will look really good at 60 right they won't look like the 60s you know you pull up someone from you know i don't know a show from the 80s right that was 60 at the time they look completely different to what a 60 year old looks now especially if there's someone that takes care of themselves so that might be a way to go and i just i don't know i think it's a good it's a good thing that's being pushed at the moment i've seen a lot of people post about it i'm seeing a lot of people post about balms and creams and shit they're buying and beard lotion all that sort of stuff <coughs> that doesn't lend itself to like a crazy hipster dirty alibi sweaty kind of person you kind of need to be a little bit clean to give a shit about your beard you know and um, i'm liking the movement i think it's really amazing um i would like to see maybe a lot more a few more male um uh, focus brands maybe coming into that sector you know maybe really dominating that field especially when it comes to like a black or brown people like a Fenty from like a, a, a version of Fenty but for men you know like for guys that want to look really good or or for guys that want to look good without it looking like they're trying right so like a nice face wash a nice sheen thing that doesn't make you look like um, one of those makeup girls on YouTube it doesn't make you look too crazy but something that can kind of really bring you out bring up the best in you just like you know that whole look that you look like when you go to like a barber and they give you the whole hot towel treatment they give you the whole like black mask thing to peel off and get all the little zits out maybe there should be a line that someone wants to create that would, that, that would do that kind of job and I think that would really really be well welcome especially with you know a generation of kids who kind of are skewing away from the drinking and drug abuse thing and more focusing on like you know the self-care idea and I've, i love it man I, th I thought it was amazing um the whole article is really cool too i'll link it in the show notes as i mentioned previously and you guys can read it yourself what else is on the docket um oh this uh, this article kind of annoyed me so um it reads it's a article i saw on Res a resident advisor right um, if we get up on the screen, I'll uh, show in a minute. Um, the title is Over 100 Festivals Join Key Change Pledge to Book More Women. Now, this has been something that I've heard spoken about a few times. Um, I think I come to my attention a lot that there's maybe this conversation happening when Black Madonna, I think, did a Resident Advisor Exchange, like an interview with Res Resident Advisor, or of course, Resident Advisor Exchange, um, or someone else. She did an interview speaking about, you know, the perils of how hard it is to come up in the scene you know not being i wouldn't i don't think she'd be offended if i say it but not being a quote-unquote like pretty dj right she's just a woman that plays music and is fucking amazing or she happens to be a lady that plays music and she's fucking good at what she does and it kind of made me think you know oh that's that's fucked up in it like i never thought about that other side of things right when you're not like you know a page three model and you decide to like get serato on your laptop well how hard that must be um because there is like a weird unconscious bias people do have to people that look attractive, right? Regardless, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, right? I suck. That's why like an Adam Bayer and a Nina Kravitz, you know, have like adoring fans. Part of the reason is because they're really good DJs and make me good music. But it's also because, you know, they look stunning, both of them. But, um, and I think there used to be a couple too, which is interesting that I mentioned them. But I saw a lot of that talk happening. And then from that kind of conversation, I saw a lot of talk online about the how hard it is for women DJs to get booked which I always thought was weird, right? Because whenever I've had friends, I've had a lot, I've got a lot of friends who play music, right? And there's a, it's probably an even split people that I know personally, DJs who are women, right? It's a quite an even split. And for the most part, if I think about it, the women probably are, are smashing it more than the guys are from the pool of people that I know. They're playing at festivals, they've got radio shows, they produce, you know what I mean? They're, they're going for it, they're always around, always about. Whenever I, I don't really check Instagram that often anymore, but when I did check it, you always see them touring um, com as compared to the, the kind of the guys. And I always thought, I thought there was, and I always thought, and I always um, assumed that everyone understood that there was a general consensus or an acceptance that 
because you know you can you know you don't have to like stretch an arm out to find a dj in your friend circle that's a guy right djs everywhere you know boys pick up you know boys you know there's loads of guys djs that you know out there if you're half decent enough female i always thought everyone kind of accepted that people would give you the opportunity to kind of like you know jump the queue because they wanted uh the dance floor to reflect the dj booth right because when you go to a festival or nightclub you don't always see all guys maybe depending on what kind of music they're playing but for the most part there are girls there too so why not have that represented on your dj especially when it's djing it's not like modeling or it's not um something else that's subjective or whatever maybe or maybe athletic and kind of um uh, dependent on your genes maybe if you're like you know there's no like i don't know 100 meter sprinters from india for instance right um, it's not dependent on that, right, DJing. It's just the fact that, you know, if you can play, if you've got, like, good taste and you can play music, right, you can be a DJ. So it, it, I always thought it was understanding that everyone accepted that, you know, some girls that get pushed to the front of the line aren't there for merit. They're sometimes there because they're girls. But, and I thought that was okay. I didn't, I didn't mind that, you know? Like, I think it's cool when you go to a bar or you go to a club and you see a, a really cool or a really cool girl playing music. It's just nice to see. It's just, oh, that's interesting. And you, and you always, also, it's like um, different races playing music. It's the same, right? You sometimes always get a different feel of what it is to be a DJ when a girl's DJing. It's just a different kind of vibe. It just feels, I don't know, it's weird to describe it, especially when I, saw, I forgot who the girl was. It might have been Lena Wilkins or someone I saw at Bergheim playing techno. It just, it felt different to any guy that I've seen play before. And that there must be something to do with the kind of feminine energy. Anyway, um, I always thought I was accepted, but it seems as if like there's some girls out there who think that, who even maybe accept that fact or accept that kind of assumption, but I think that's not enough. I think that festivals also need to hire more women DJs, which might have, they might have a point because I remember someone saying to me the other day that, um, or mention or bringing my attention that Wireless Festival, before they made the changes that have been made now, was all men. I didn't know that, right? I thought, well, there has to be some girls on it because there's, there's loads of girls in the UK scene or even in Europe that are smashing it. And he's like, no, nah, it's completely men oriented. But I don't think it was a conscious thing. It's just like, you know, Whoever's booking for Wireless Festival just looked at the Spotify playlist, maybe it's re uh, restricted to region in terms of the UK and just, you know, book the people that everyone's playing in the UK for the most part. And it happened to be guys. It wasn't their fault. But there's also the idea that, you know, that maybe the pool to choose from is quite small when it comes to women, right? So if you're a female DJ and you feel like you're not getting booked, it might be the fact that because there's so many guy DJs, there's going to be a lot more good ones because there's just some more of them about, right? So they'll get all the bookings and then the girls who are good are going to find it hard to get in because there's so many guys that are already established and kind of on that lane of, of thought. But I thought it'll be, I thought it, it'll be more of a thing of like the promoter, not something that they announce, kind of having a stipulation that they say, you know what, we're going to try and book one or two girls or whatever it may be on the lineup of, a, of whatever thing you're doing, right? Or we're going to have an even split. I thought that would be more sensible, but it seems like, you know, having a festival come out and say, you know, they're going to pledge to having more female DJs or what the headline say um it's just a little it feels a little bit forced and I don't know if I was a woman if I would be comfortable being booked to play a big festival not like a club thing I think that's different I think a club thing someone tells you to play in a club and you know they've got you on there because you're a girl because you might bring girls down I think I don't know it might be that might be easier to swallow for your ego or for your pride but to be booked to play a festival and you're only there because you're a girl I don't know, man. But anyway, um, the article basically reads as follows. I've got it up on the screen, uh, but I'll link it as always in the show notes for you li guys listening of, on YouTube and shit. Um, it says more than 100 uh, music festivals have, ple have joined the pledge to diversify the lineup in 2022. Diversify as well. I don't know. Um, we're, it's an interesting word, right? Um, the keychain campaign was first announced in February when 45 festivals, including Mutech, Worldwide Fest, um, Iceland Airways, and Pop Kota signed up. The pledge organized by the UK non profit PRS Foundation requires oh, that's people that oh, everyone gets their money from requires festivals to achieve and ma uh, maintain a 50 50 gender, gender balance, which is crazy. There's no way going to be 50 50 gender balance, just in terms of options. There's going to be more guys around playing music than there are girls. Just and the PR fan CEO said, uh, spoke about the increasing focus on US and Canada festivals campaign. Da, da. Anyway, the comment was interesting, right? Someone said in the comments, here, a lady, I'm guessing by Avatar, maybe she's not, but she basically said, this lady said, Groove Venus in the comments, when I began attempting to DJ, this is responding to the article, she writes, when I began attempting to DJ in 1995 in the States, I was surrounded by female DJs and producers. 995, she says, right? There really isn't a dangerous shortage of female identified DJs or producers who are talented enough to rock large music festivals. There also isn't a shortage of musicians who you'd, you'd highly rate if you listen to their music without being aware of their gender. However, many promoters don't make a conscious or concerted effort to diversify the lineup regarding, regardless of whether or ever 
that diversity encompasses gender, orientation, ethnicity, or music genre. It takes a lot more effort than just listening to whatever promos happen to roll in, your, uh, in or booking your friends or fi- flight sharing who, with whoever your friend happens to be booking. Also, I didn't know about that flight sharing stuff. Also, decades of peer-reviewed research consistently showed that representation does not impact behavior. In other words, that women seeing DJs produce, perform, has an impact on how many women in... Da, 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 da. Okay, we, that obviously makes sense, right? If you see someone looks like you're doing something, you're going to want to do it too, right? Um, now, I don't know, man. I think I would much prefer it if it wasn't like a, it wasn't like something that was enforced and people signed up and players to do 50-50 thing. I'd like maybe more promoters to take more of a concert, like I mentioned, a concert effort to kind of diversify the lineup. I know when I used to put nights on, it was really important to have like a wide ranging of sounds for the night just because, you know, if you're, if you're putting on a nightclub event, for six hours and stuff it's nice to have a different kind of vibe every hour or every half hour and a half just because you know just so people don't get bored and it's just a bit more exciting people stay and it's interesting whatever it may be but it was also interesting also good to have if there were girls around to kind of book them because it was just cool to see and in dj be like a girl playing it's just really nice especially in a kind of male dominated industry but when somewhere when it's a place with male dominated i don't think the idea is to kind of force people to book djs of that female it might be to diversify and hope that over time the pool of female DJs expands to a point where you don't need to have a thing where you have a quota anymore. It's just like, oh, she's amazing because she's been playing for 30 years. But for the most part, the pool of female DJs that are smashing it right now, they're quite it's quite small. It's not that big. And if anything, it's gonna put everyone it's like that. What was that thing that happened? Um, what's that word? There's a phrase for it in America. Um where they encourage it's for black people in general more so black and brown people they for there's a law that they have in place to like kind of like enforce some universities i don't know maybe yale harvard those kind of places those ivy league universities to induct people from a certain race certain background and there was loads of research showing that when people are fast tracked to kind of like go to oxford or cambridge because they happen to be black or come from a, a low impoverished area not because of their grades not based on their grades or their competence when they're just high when they just you know um, enrolled just on that basis they usually drop out really quickly because they f- quickly realize that they're not really as good they're not as good as they're not as they're not at the level that they need to be at to kind of operate well to kind of do well and you know for you like shame and feeling a little inadequate they just drop out so what you want to do is that you want to encourage people who are wherever they are in the area they are whether girls or right? you want to encourage them to be like okay this is not just a guy thing it's not just a boys club girls can do it too here's how you do it and then you encourage them to kind of encourage each other. And then hopefully over time, the pool will increase. And then you can pick who you want to pick without the gender. But I think this is a kind of dangerous road to go down, you know, because also if I was a guy and this happened, you know, and someone was getting booked just because of what they have in between their legs, I'd be super annoyed. The same way you'd be annoyed if someone was getting booked just because they were a certain color. I'd be like, huh? That's not, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's like, um, I think Airbnb CEO said it the other day, like um, he was asked a question, um, I think in a Recode interview with uh, Kara Swisher about our, uh, because I think he he had a pledge as well to like have a 50-50 split on his board, advisory board, and it's like of men and women. It's like Jesus Christ, like that's that's in business, right? Where people's livelihoods are at stake and stuff. That's you can't be you know um, partaking in identity politics, right? You can't be doing that. You just can't. Um, you have to have the most competent person, you know, do the job, right? The per- regardless of if they're in a wheelchair, if they've got one leg, one eye, gay, straight, whatever it may be, right? You, you want the best person to do the job because people are depending on you to get in, to get political and have it. It's like, it serves no one. No one wins, you know? And it's not real too because if you're a girl and you're coming up and you, and you hear, you find out so-and-so person who you look up to is only there because she's a woman, it's not a real, it doesn't, it's not something that you're going to strive for excellence. Like the stories that are going to, I think will inspire women or inspire anyone, any backgrounds are the ones where someone actually comes through some hardship, some real hustle. Like they really had to like battle and fight with the best of them, whoever they may be. Right. And then they've succeeded. That's real. Cause that shows, Oh yeah, I can really do it. As opposed to like someone that just got in with a quota. I don't know. It just seemed a bit weird, but again, it made me conflicted because I know anyone, any girl that I've bumped into, I've spoken to says they want to DJ or says they are DJing. Um, I've always encouraged them a lot and I've always told them that you're going to get a lot further than I am because you're a girl and you should you and you should like use it to your advantage like lean into it like lean into it like I don't know give your other girlfriends and throw like a female only rave right a female only house a deep house techno disco party like it really does help like use use the um use whatever social um advantage you have to your uh, to your benefit but, you know, there's no need to cheat, right? There's no need to kind of jump the queue because you already jumped the queue anyway, right? And you're doing well. But just get better at your craft and then eventually you'll kind of get to that level of festival. I think festival-wise, like, 
you can't be having amateurs there like really like i'm not a fan of djs in, in festivals anyway right i've never been a fan of it. i think it just doesn't work in general unless you've got like a, a glastonbury affair where it's like new york city down low it's sort of like in a tent i think lovebox tried to do the same sort of thing but it didn't quite work there either when i saw dj harvey a few years ago but overall i don't think they work anywhere but if they are gonna work you really need someone really competent at playing festivals because playing music in the daytime or with the sun out right open air it's completely different to playing in a club so you need someone that's really experienced about you know leading people for a night it's not it's a difficult it's something that requires someone that knows what they're doing and i would hate to have some i would hate it if like someone got thrown in the deep end and felt like they were doing a shit job and then you're kind of re-questioning everything you're doing because you know someone just hired you based on your gender i thought i don't know it just run me up the wrong way in general anyway. i didn't think that was a good way to go about things but hey what do i know maybe that might be a good incentive to get more women involved um what else? Uh, um, should we speak about... Oh, Studio 54 documentary. That's what I'll speak about, actually. I watched the Studio 54 documentary the other day. Studio 54. I'm speaking too fast. Um, the legendary New York City nightclub from the 70s, 80s, I'd say, right? Uh, legendary disco nightclub uh, frequented by the likes of Andy Warhol. Um, I don't know. Michael Jackson, Diana Ross, blah, 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 right? Well-known disco party disco um nightclub which was kind of you know at the forefront of kind of pushing nightlife culture and this kind of a template that got carried over or copied by loads of other places in general and i have to say right um there's loads of documentaries out there and everyone's doing their thing whatever but this might be one of the most important documentaries to watch might be almost the most influential important documentary especially if you're someone like me who's obsessed with nightlife culture you know that malaco just culture in general especially the arts and shit I highly recommend you watch it. It is fucking amazing. Especially after reading um the Andy Warhol um Man on Man on Man on Fire? No? What's it called? Oh, anyway, I forgot the book. The Andy Warhol book that I'm kind of reading at the moment. After reading that, um it really does this documentary really comes to life. Um but you can even watch documentary without reading the book on Andy Warhol that I'm reading at the moment. But this documentary kind of charts basically the you know the inception of two fifty four from his first day opening to his heady days to finally getting, you know, um, having the IRS come down on him like a sack of bricks and then suddenly, you know, finally the prison imprisonment, one of the partners dying and blah, blah, blah. And it kind of influences had in a legacy. But the story told, like, orally with pictures and unseen video footage that we kind of never seen. And they also tied in with a book, which I have somewhere around here, but can't type and get it. But they also tied it up. They've got, like, a massive, like, coffee table book that they've made too. Um... It's amazing to hear the story because it really was inspiring. I think that kind of was the kind of activation that kind of got me thinking, you know what, maybe I kind of need to um, stop being so reckless and kind of, you know, get back into like getting back into my pocket and kind of do what I need to do to kind of leave my mark on the whole cultural timeline, right? Because it was inspiring because at that time, right, they were doing things so, they were doing something so out of left field, right, that it beggars belief, right? This idea of like having this nightclub where they introduced the whole velvet rope thing at the front, hot, sexy celebs coming in, really forward thinking music, the the kind of open um the open uh, inviting people from like the gay trans community to come in, you know, embracing them, the whole gay liberation thing. Like there was a movement that happened there that was organic and real, but also something that, you know, that is inspiring because it shows, you know, just how it just shows that there's no limitations really like you can you can really change the world for the better and the reason why i say change the world for the better because clubs such as like that that you know allow people to see you know what being gay and queer is really about right and get to see that they're just like us you know you share you share a space with people like that who you think might be other and then you realize that we're all the same we all go through our own struggles and um that kind of music being pushed to the forefront you know you see stuff like i don't know um, rupaul's drag race benefits from the stuff of studio 54 it's just really inspiring to see how much of a influence they both the both founders had of um, had in the culture, and it also made me think a lot about Bergheim because there's a lot of parallels with Bergheim or le le lessons learned from the failings again. Because I think the success stories is, is there to the show, but the shortcomings that kind of led to Studio Fifty Four's demise are what I've seen a lot of clubs kind of <coughs> work out that they want to do better. Um, Bergheim, for instance, is really famous for like you know being very picky at the door. Uh, the bouncer Sven and other couple of guys there, are, you know, make sure that the room is highly curated. It's a kind of more of a German uh, way of going about things, right? They're very conscious that, you know, they're a oh, Berlin way. They're very con they attract a very, let's say, for lack of a better term, weirdo crowd 
that need to be in an environment that they feel comfortable in. So it's very particular. You make sure that you know, not the, you know, no one gets a bit crazy. And if you've ever been to a house party in the hood, you'll know when when some boys come in who are like a bit intimidating. It does change the whole vibe, and people stop having fun. So sometimes being a bit tight on the door can be annoying when you don't get in. But it is really important when you're trying to um, uh, quote unquote curate the night and make sure everyone's feeling comfortable and fine. So um, the Burger is really famous for it, but they're also really good at knowing of uh, turning away the amount of people they turn away are the same amount of people they invite in so there's for every 10 persons that you know it might be i don't know if it's pretty split but for every one person that you know you know someone that got into the club so where studio 54 lacked or where they fucking where they failed as you can see in the documentary is that they that's what the problems they ran into they kind of had a good start and then the exclusivity of of, of studio 54 the fact that everyone was at the front of the door like a you know just no crowd control. Look, they look at something from our Black, our, our Black Friday videos. And people obviously got left out, right? So they felt, you know, when you're standing out there and like a a, 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 a nice Cadillac rolls by and some celebrity rolls in there in front of you and you're just been waiting in a cold for seven hours and you're, you haven't got a jacket on, you just got a shirt, you don't want to leave your thing in the cloakroom, you can get a bit annoyed by it, right? So supposedly what happened was that the backlash with people not getting in kind of started the, the IRS looking into what they're doing because you know they've you know they kind of put two and two together and realized you know if they got these people outside who aren't getting in imagine what kind of money they're making on the inside and then lo and behold they realize you know there's some dodgy things happening blah 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 so it got to a point you know where you know it kind of led to their demise and i've seen the bird kind of take lessons in it and realize you know what for as exclusive as we are as we like to accurate the night let's let people in to experience it and they can tell their friends we'll tell them how to behave right you can't take pictures um you have to be comfortable being in a club that you know maybe is predominantly gay um there's all these things that you're in there. So then, and then even if you're on the dance floor, you're not allowed to take drugs on the dance floor. You have to go to the toilets or you get told off. Like it's a very, there's a lot of respect that goes into that building. So what that does is that it allows people like me who are obsessed with that club to go out and tell people, evangelize for them, right? So they don't need to do any marketing because I'm talking about it for them. But I've been there, right? I'm someone that you know, right? We're friends. I've been there. I'm a real person. I'm not a celebrity. I'm a normal guy. So that makes a club more accessible to everyone, right? So 354 fucked up in that regard. Um, the sound system, I thought um, Berghain took note of, like, because I think they said, like, you know, 354 were lucky because they took over a former theatre, right? And I think they leveled off the the floor because it was kind of um, sloped towards the front like normal theatres are. But it had the best acoustics in it because it was used as a theatre, of course. And Berghain, it's hard to describe it, but essentially what it is is that it's techno music played really loud, but I can have a conversation with you at the bar like this without shouting. So it's like expert sound engineering, expert. Like it's the idea like, you know, never go into orange or, or, or red for the worst part of it, right? Just the idea of like getting the sound perfect. So just because it's loud doesn't mean it sounds good. And the Burkheim learned that perfectly. That's kind of lesson I saw on there. And also another lesson I thought they learned from the mistake of C54, let to demise was that they were, um, one of their partners who unfortunately died of AIDS um late uh towards the end of the time there he was very outlandish and the face of the you know the kind of the face of the club and putting his face everywhere um kind of a little bit celebrity hungry and that attracted unnecessary attention again you know it kind of made them seem a little bit like you know big big shots and for the most part apart from sven right they're quite low-key about you know whoever runs it it's mostly about the music mostly about the djs right there, there was a time when they didn't they didn't used to publish their playlist right their uh their lineup sorry you had to go on a special website have a password to say who was playing on the night you wouldn't even know <clears throat> so any given night it could be anyone playing it could be like i don't know a sven var playing on a, on a sunday like an eight hour set you'd have no idea you just it's about it was less about who was playing and more so about Berghain itself and that comes from the idea of like you know no one's at the front saying i founded it I'm the director of Panorama Bar. I run the record part. Everyone's kind of behind the scenes. You might you might have heard of some Bergheim residents who play there every week and stuff, but for the most part, it's very low key. And I think, especially nowadays, where everyone's kind of you know desperate to kind of be on front of the camera and you know say, hey, look what how look how amazing I am. It's quite refreshing to have like a nightclub that's that influential. That's kind of you know just keeps things kind of you know a bit professional and lets the kind of club speak for itself. But I highly recommend you check out the documentary. It's probably one of the best things I've seen this year, easily. Um, it's very, really inspiring. And like I said to you before, like, it really just makes me, makes me, it really just, like, reaffirms the idea, like, you know, you can change the world for the better, like, a tiny bit. You can just do a little tiny thing that can, you know, lead to wherever we are nowadays in culture where, you know, no one gives a fuck if you're in a nightclub and there's people that aren't into the same people that you're into, you know, who have a different sexual orientation. No one gives a fucking fuck. And, but the aesthetic, the music in there, everything was inspiring. So I highly recommend you check it out. Studio 54, a documentary. It should be available in most places. 
Um, but yeah, I thought that might be a good way to end it overall. This has been episode number 80 of the Exeter Singer Show. Um, tomorrow is what, Friday? And then Saturday is a big day, right? England versus Sweden. Oh my God, in the quarterfinals of the oh, this last 16, whatever it may be, of the World Cup. Um, so that'll be a good place to maybe come back. Maybe I'll do another one actually on Sunday to kind of recap on, you know, if England are through or out, whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, that'll be the end of the week for then. And then actually, oh no, Friday tomorrow, I'm playing at the tap. I'm saying playing at Tap East. If you happen to be in the whole East London area and you want to see this old um, massive head play some music in a very friendly bar, <laughs> then come down to Tap East in Westwood Stratford. I'll be playing some disco house R and B and all that malarkey. You can find details um, on my website axinozinga.com on the DJ listings. It's got all my dates on there. Uh, and I think that'll be it for the most part. I've got some other dates coming up towards the end of the month, but I'll announce them uh, when they get confirmed and everything. But yeah, this has been the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 80. Thank you so much for joining me on this night. You know, the, the, the sky's changing. Everything's kind of getting a bit weird now. I'm going to go off, smoke a little bit more, watch a little movie and then go to sleep and get running again tomorrow. Hope you guys have a great day, week, evening and all that malarkey and see you again very soon. Peace.